Andy, thank you so much, and um, such a privilege to be here. I mean that sincerely. I looked at that program, and uh, there's Dr. So-and-so, and Pastor So-and-so, and Dr. So-and-so, and Pastor So-and-so, and then there's Brother Jim Ellis. And I was trying to figure out just why I'm called Brother Jim Ellis, and I think it's because I'm a brother to Tom Ellis, maybe. But at any rate, it's a great privilege to be here. Richard Owen Roberts in a little book that we published and has just come uh, in uh, on the mail uh, train here, just been delivered to us. You can pick this up outside there in the, uh, in the foyer. A little book called Solemn Assembly. Perhaps you've read it. In this little book, when he examines the issue of the sacred assembly or the solemn assembly, he says there are four elements common to revival. First of all, a tragic declension. Secondly, a righteous judgment from God. Thirdly, the raising up of a deeply, immensely burdened leader or leaders. And then in the fourth place, an extraordinary action. Now, the extraordinary action that he uh, uncovers as he looks through the 10 or 12 revivals of the Old Testament, the one that most often appears is that of the sacred assembly, the solemn assembly. Assembly. And it's been my assignment here to uh, talk to you about this, uh, this method. And I want you to know I, I share it with a bit of trepidation because sharing a method uh, is in and of itself uh, can be a very dangerous thing. You remember the book of Isaiah in chapter 1, God says, I hate your solemn assemblies. So it is possible for us to function, it's possible us, uh, in, a, in a way that would be proper uh, in terms of a solemn assembly and miss the spirit of it entirely. And I hope that as I go through this today that you will catch something of the deep uh, spirit and contrition that we need as we approach God in a sacred assembly. It's possible to pray and be an abomination to God, isn't it? It's possible to take the Lord's table and eat and drink judgment to ourselves. So we must be very careful as we talk about these particular issues. In another way, the uh, leaders of this conference have asked me also in some sense to summarize some of what has been happening. And uh, I find that uh, a, a somewhat difficult task. These have been wonderful message, messages. Tony, I, I don't know, uh, it's been a long time since I've heard such a, a good message on the glory of Christ. And I want to thank you for sharing that. In a way, that was the summary message because we can do no better than summarizing everything in Jesus, by whom all things were created, for whom all things exist, uh, through whom all things consist, in whom all things will consummate. You can't do better than that in terms of summarizing everything, can you? But I want us to look at this uh, very interesting subject of the solemn assembly. And uh, John Armstrong stole my text on the first night. You know, when you go to these conferences, uh, you have this constant fear. And I told my wife uh, a few days beforehand, I said, John's going to get my text. And uh, she said, well, why don't you call him? I said, no, I'm just going to risk it. And I wish I'd called him. It would have saved me a lot of time at night here at this conference. But I've been working uh, then at another text, which the Lord has uh, drawn me to. And it's found in the book of Nehemiah. Chapters 8 and 9. Let's go to Nehemiah chapters 8 and 9 together. I want us just to pray again and ask the Lord's help for this, this time, all right? Let's bow our heads in prayer. Father, these have been holy moments. And uh, as I sat back in the back and listened to Tony... Um, express something of your glory and as we sang this song a moment ago I was just reminded again of the very same thing you said to me so many times how you impressed it upon me last evening that I am nothing and you are everything and if I could and if we could here in this place be burnt out for you if we could sacrifice all everything that we have if we could lay it all before you, uh, it would not be an offering worthy of you. For you are so great, so magnificent, so powerful, so majestic, so beyond our description. You have talked, baby talk to us in the Bible, and there's so much more about you. 
There's so much more that we could learn. And your glory will be never-ending. And when we get to heaven, we will never exhaust uh, our understanding of your glory and forever we'll learn of you. And I want to praise you for that. I want to thank you that the theme of our lives and the theme of this conference and the theme of our preaching can be Jesus Christ, for there can be no greater one to speak of. I pray, Father, that you would settle over us here with the heaviness of your glory. We're undeserving of that. We're a very plain people, Lord. And uh, without your help, without your assistance, without your Holy Spirit's uh, interjecting life into what we do, we really have nothing worth anything. We don't want to have another boring session, another pedantic preacher. Father, what we want is for the unction of your Holy Spirit to come, for the power of your presence to be known, to be felt. Lord, like Whitfield, we want to preach a felt Christ. And so, Father, everything is vain unless the Holy Spirit comes down. And so we beseech you, Lord, we open up our hearts before you. We just lift up ourselves, our open hearts, our hands, and say, Lord, please come down here among us. Please, Lord, visit us in our day. We pray, Father, that our children would grow up under the prevailing Word of God, that we would see the day of your glory, that we would see that powerful display that we call revival, and that it would not be just a flash over a short period of time, but, Father, we pray for a revival of the Word of God, of great doctrine, of great, uh, uh, of great sense and calling for your presence and yearning for you, Lord, a great revival that will last for at least a generation and will affect the lives of our family and our friends and those people in our community that we have pled with about you. Lord, we long for that. And sometimes, Father, we sit in our studies and we feel such abject poverty of spirit, such lowness, such vileness in us that we think we can never preach the Word. And yet, Father, the greatness of the flood tide of your Word carries us along. And we pray, Father, that we might see torrents of blessing and tidal waves of revival in our country. Father, we also come to you and ask for the ability to hear well. I pray, Father, that you might open our ears as we listen to your word today, that things might be heard which are said, but things might also be heard that are not even said as your Holy Spirit works in our lives. And Father, for pastors in this place who are struggling in their situations, help us, Father, not to pity ourselves, not to cry about the uncomfortableness of our situations, but to rejoice in the glories of Christ, in the power of the Word, in the effectiveness of your Holy Spirit in our lives. Help us, Lord, to be lifted up above the mundaneness and the difficulties of our situations and to, with biblical optimism, look forward to the day of your power. We pray this, Lord, now in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, brothers, let's turn together to Nehemiah chapter 8. We're going to look at chapter 8 and chapter 9 of this great text of Scripture. And I, I think you understand, as uh, we look at this text, that We've had the Babylonian captivity now for 70 years, and these people are now returning to their land. And um, the book of Ezra and Nehemiah work together as a unit, but they've returned to the land. However, they have not fully and completely returned to God. And when we look in this chapter 8 and chapter 9, we're going to find out how a people returned 
to the Lord. And in this passage of Scripture, we're going to be introduced to the solemn assembly. But we're going to talk about how to return to God. When I was a little kid, I remember going out to Florida. My dad, I believe, went to the Southern Baptist Convention and took us along. I wasn't too interested in the convention at that time. But I remember going out into the ocean uh, there on that beach hotel, and uh, before I knew it, I was being carried out by the undertow. Have you ever had that experience? And I felt like I could do nothing about it. And there is, as we've heard so eloquently put to John and others this uh, week, a great undertow, isn't there, of the prevailing culture of our day that is pulling our churches out and pulling us as individual pastors out, pulling our church members out into the deep where we seem to have uh, no chance of being saved. And we have to ask ourselves the question, how do we return to God? God is a great king. He's a majestic Lord. He's the master of all the universe. What way do you come to this king? How do you come to him? Esther had to think about how to come before the presence of a king. The prodigal son had to think about how to come before his loving father. There is a way to come before God. And this passage of scripture, I believe, describes the way for us in, in an articulate way. Now let's look at chapter 8 and verse 1 and following. And here's what we find. Now all the people gathered together as one man in the open square that was in front of the water gate. And they told Ezra the scribe to bring the book of the law of Moses, which the Lord had commanded Israel. So Ezra the priest brought the law, law before the assembly of men and women and all who could hear with understanding on the first day of the seventh month. Then he read from it in the open square that was in front of the water gate from morning until midday before the men and the women and those who could understand. And the ears of all the people were attentive to the book of the law. So Ezra the scribe stood on a platform of wood which they had made for that purpose and beside him at his right hand stood Mattathiah, Shema, Ananiah, Urijah, Hilkiah, Messiah, and at his left hand, Padiah, Meshiel, Malkijah, Hashem, Hashbadana, Zechariah, and Meshulam. And Ezra opened the book in the sight of all the people, for he was standing above all the people. And when he opened it, all the people stood up. And Ezra blessed the Lord, the great God. This was the Baruch, you know, of the Old Testament people. Then all the people answered, Amen, Amen, while lifting up their hands. And they bowed their heads, and they worshipped the Lord with their faces to the ground. And Jeshua, Bani, Sherebiah, Jamin, Akub, Shabbatiah, Hodijah, Messiah, Kelita, Azariah, Josabad, Hanan, Peliah, and the Levites helped the people to understand the law, and the people stood in their place. So they read distinctly from the book and the law of God, and they gave the sense, and they helped them to understand the reading. Now let me stop right here and make this first observation, which I think is so vital for us today. And we've heard so clearly uh, said virtually through every message that we've heard. Let me summarize it like this. If we're going to return to God, my friends, there must be a recovery of the place of the Word of God in our churches. There must be a recovery. The leading element, I've been doing a lot of reading on revival now that I've come uh, to take this position at Midwestern Seminary. And uh, as I've been reading about the subject of revival, I'm almost overwhelmed about what I find. But what I find prevailing throughout each story that I read, it seems, is this recovery of the Word of God. Revival, in its essence, can almost be uh, considered a recovery of the gospel itself, in fact. It's some vital point of the gospel, like justification by faith, the regeneration, these two particularly, the judgment of God, the sovereignty of God, often repeated, uh, coming up in the history of revival. But it is always... Men preaching the Word of God with everything that they have in a high and lifted view of the Bible that God uses 
in great revivals. And even in the 1904 revival of Wales, which many people know, uh, they told the preachers to sit down and be quiet. There was, in fact, far more preaching than you could imagine. And most people don't understand that situation. They don't realize that higher criticism had gripped those pastors all throughout that land. And the people who had a memory of revival and a, an understanding of the Word of God had to tell those pastors to be quiet or they would have killed everything. But could it have been like the other revivals in Wales, it would have been a revival of great preaching. Now, my friends, let me ask you something. How is it that God says he regenerates a man or a woman? We've already heard the text in 1 Peter chapter 1 that we are born again, not with corruptible seed, but with incorruptible. That is, through the living and abiding Word of God. And this was the Word which was preached to you. Now, I dare say that none of us here understand the mystery involved in the, pre the relationship between the preaching of the Word of God and regeneration. However, the Puritans understood that there was an essential relationship. And the Bible speaks of it so clearly in this passage and in other places. That that seed, which corresponds not to plant seed, but corresponds to the biological seed, that seed, which is not corruptible like the original seed that gave you physical life, but is incorruptible, that seed is transmitted somehow mysteriously by the Spirit of God via the preaching of the Word of God. This is the reason our forebears in early days who came to the United States, came to America, not then the United States, but they understood something. They understood that as they, that, that if there was to be broad effects, of, if there was to be numbers of people converted, if this land was to be a promised land as they projected that it would be in their eschatological scheme, if it was to be all they thought it should be, there was going to have to be the prevailing Word of God. And in every place, especially in the home, there was to be the constant access to the Word of God because only through the Word of God could people be regenerated. And let me ask you, what was it that Jesus said was the means by which we are sanctified? Didn't he say in John chapter 17, verse 17, sanctify them, which means really make them distinct from all the rest, make them peculiar people unusual by virtue of their likeness to you. Make, make them different people. Sanctify them by means of the truth. Thy word is truth. Now, if God himself has given us in his book the means by which people are regenerated and the means by which people are sanctified and are able to handle all of the difficulties and the vicissitudes of life, if it is through the living and abiding word of God that these things happen, Tell me, do you think that God would ever bring a revival that did not emphasize the very element which he is designed to use in regenerating and sanctifying people? He is designed that the Word of God be at the heart of everything. So every one of the speakers has been right on target all through this week, and I've been so encouraged by that. It was the holding up of the Word of God consistently before people. One of the reasons that I am not fond of a public altar call, a public invitation system, is because I don't want to diminish in any way the power of the Word of God. I don't want to blow off the steam of conviction. I want, I want the people to know that it is in the preaching of the Word of God that do God does His most powerful work. Charles Spurgeon used to have an inquiry room, you remember, on Tuesdays, but he was afraid of having it on a regular basis for, peer, for fear that people would think that more was happening in an inquiry room than was happening through the preaching of the Word of God. I happen to believe, and I think you do as well, along with me, that the Word of God preached in the power of the Spirit of God is great enough to save people and to change people. And we need nothing else. And so I'm doing all that I can as a reformer, and I hope you think of yourselves as a reformer in this day that desperately needs reformation. 
I'm doing all I can in my little part of the world to bring to bear the Word of God on the hearts of people. I'm reading larger portions of Scripture nowadays because I believe people need to hear the Word of God. My messages, I'm trying to make sure they're bound to the text. I'm preaching longer the Word of God. I'm encouraging more fervently private time with God in the Word. We're starting a church, Don Whitney and myself, along with some students there at the seminary because of a desperate need of, of a church that preaches the Bible and believes correctly. And we don't think we're the only one, but we think there needs to be more, and so we're starting one. But we're, we're tying it to the 1689 Confession because we believe it helps us believe the Word more and take seriously the doctrines of Scripture. And one of the things that I'm finding as I go around the country uh, most needed and something that God has burdened my heart about intensely is this issue of family worship. You can't be around me very long before I look you in the face if you're a pastor and say, men, you talk about reforming your church, let me tell you a place to begin. Get every man in your every man in your church to be a pastor of his own home and teach them how to have family worship and you have family worship i know of no greater way to get the gospel to my children and to help my children live life like they're supposed to than daily time in the word of god and don't read devotional books read the word of god and you know men sometimes in the preaching of the word of god And in the reading and the teaching of the Word of God, God does the most remarkable things. Not just the ongoing work, as miraculous as it is, of regenerating, regenerating people one by one here and there, or that work of strengthening the believers, which he does regularly through that preaching of the Word. Not the ordinary work, but sometimes there is the extraordinary work of God, as Tony was expressing. Sometimes, and, and we, you know, we have a, 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 a biblical optimism as we preach the Word of God. God forbid that you should go to the pulpit without some ambition that God would use this Word in a powerful way to transform lives. And so these remarkable things happen sometimes. And this is what we mean when we talk about revival, isn't it? We don't mean something different in kind. We know that the God is using the same means of the preaching of the Word that He always uses, even in hard times, to bring people to Himself and to strengthen people. But now, in the time of revival, in the time of great recovery, in the time that God really restores His people, He uses the Word of God in such a powerful, remarkable, extraordinary way beyond what we've ever seen before. In mass, that's what we're looking for. And we should go to that pulpit I think every time we step up to, the, up to that pulpit, whether you have 15 people or whether you have 1,000 people that you preach to, and you should go to that pulpit and say, Oh, God, this could be the day that you use mightily your word. We must expect God to work and to do great things. I just returned from Wales where we had a conference on revival. And I uh, picked up a book there on great Welsh preaching. It's not... It's not published here in the United States. But I was reading about a man that I didn't know anything about. His name was Michael Roberts. There's so many great revivals in, in the land of Wales, the land of revivals. And um, I read about this man who was asked to preach at the Calvinist Methodist Association meeting. They have associations or had associations. And uh, it was the year 1819. It was in a town called Flanders in Wales. And um, that's just a day that they get together from all over the area and they hear three or four days of good preaching. And they do this about every quarter. So in 1819, this man was asked to preach. And when he came into this little town, he overheard somebody uh, speaking some kind of vile expression and it stirred up in him of this tremendous desire. It seemed to him to be an indication of the ungodliness and the wickedness of the people in that town. He couldn't eat that night. Uh, he, he tried to go to sleep. He couldn't sleep. All night long, he wrestled with God in prayer. He got up the next morning. He couldn't eat his breakfast. And he went to preach out in front of the Red Lion Hotel. 
outside. There was a large crowd that came to hear him. And as he preached, he picked the text, Psalm 1-5, which says, Therefore the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment, nor the wicked, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. You know the passage. And when he got to the end of this message, he was describing the throne of God and the judging the people at the end of all time and how the wicked would not be able to stand in that judgment. And then at the end, he looks up as a preacher to God and he says something like this, O oh, mighty Jesus, withhold thine hand. Say not a word more unto them. O oh, judge, they're already in the agony of death. They're already overwhelmed. And the reply from the throne was this, No, I have one word yet more to say to them. And that word I must say to them, after that, not another, forever. Depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire. Well, when he said those words, it was like a bomb hitting that congregation of people. In fact, the people were so disrupted at the agony of their emotion that the gentleman who tried to close the meeting was ineffective in closing the meeting. You know, when God comes up, you can't really close it. Well, in that, that was April, 1819. By the end of that year in that little town, that small church, there were a hundred people who were converted by virtue of that sermon, came to the pastor, wanted to talk about their souls, and were converted as a result of that message. By May of the next year, there were another 50 people. But in Montgomery Shire as a whole, consisting of several churches, it is said that over a thousand people were converted by virtue of that one sermon. Now, brothers, that's preaching with the extraordinary power of God. It will not be apart from the Word of God. But sometimes we come, we come to the Scripture with such optimism, we come to our pulpits with such optimism that this might be the day that God might rain down powerful through His Word. And He might make these words like a sharp sword into the hearts of people. It can happen. It can happen in your place. Ordinary preachers. I think of that preacher that we so often mention, David Morgan, another Welsh man, who said, of course, he went to bed one night, David Morgan, and he woke up a lion. God came upon him for what? for the preaching of the Word of God. And so these people were sitting on this first day of the seventh month under the hearing of the Scriptures with such openness, like little birds with their mouths open. They were listening to the Word of God. Now notice what happens as they hear the Word of God. Isn't it a beautiful phrase, by the way, in verse 8? They read distinctly from the book. Isn't that wonderful? They read distinctly from the book in the law of God. And they gave the sense and they helped them to understand the reading. Probably no better definition of preaching than that, is there? Because it's the text that's the best thing, isn't it? And look what he says. And Nehemiah, who was governor, and Ezra the priest and scribe and the Levites who taught the people, said to all the people, This day is holy to the Lord your God. Do not mourn nor weep. Now that seems like a very curious phrase, doesn't it? What we long for is to peop for people to weep before the Word of God. But however, we must understand that the first day of the seventh month was a day that they blew the trumpets in Israel, and it was one of their special days, and it was a day specifically designed for rejoicing. And if God is holy, what do, what do people do if God is ho considered holy by them? They do what God says. That's the way you honor the holiness of God. And the people, though they had forgotten much of what they were to do uh, as, as God's people, did remember that the first day of the seventh month, which, which is a great feast month, there's three things that happen in that seventh month, but that first day is a very special day, and it's a day for rejoicing and not for being sad. And so the people said, the leaders said, don't be sad, don't mourn under the hearing of the word. This day is holy to the Lord your God. Do not mourn nor weep, for all the people wept when they heard the words of the law. Then he said to them, Go your way, eat the fat, 
drink the sweet, and send portions to those for whom nothing is prepared, for this day is holy to our Lord. Do not sorrow, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. Now, this had the effect of allowing them... You know, it's an interesting thing. When people began to be affected by the Word of God, we see this in the history of revival. Some wise leaders at various times, when they're under great contrition, would actually stop the flow of their tears so that they would not miss what the Word of God would say. Do you understand what I'm saying? And this had the effect of doing that because for some days now they were going to hear the word of God and be sober enough to hear it so the Levites quieted all the people saying be still for the day is holy do not be grieved and all the people went their way to eat and drink to sin portions and rejoice greatly because they understood the words that were declared to them now he said on the second day now this was not a day required for them to gather together in the Jewish calendar however they came back together and here's what they found on the second day the heads of the fathers' houses of all the people with the priests and the Levites were gathered to Ezra the scribe in order to understand the words of the law. And they found written in the law which the Lord had commanded by Moses that the children of Israel should dwell in booths during the feast of the seventh month. Now this, month, this feast was to last from the 15th day of the month until the 21st day, and then on the 22nd day there was to be a solemn assembly. And that they should announce and proclaim in all their cities and in Jerusalem, saying, Go out to the mountain and bring olive branches, branches of oil trees, myrtle branches, palm branches, and branches of leafy trees, to make booths, as it is written. Then the people went out and brought them and made themselves booths, each one on the roof of his house or in their courtyards or in the courts of the house of God and in the open squares of the water gate and in the open square of the gate of Ephraim. So the whole assembly of those who'd returned from the captivity made booths and sat under the booths. For since the days of Joshua, the son of Nun, until that day, the children of Israel had not done so, and there was very great gladness. And day by day, from the first day, notice this, until the last day, he read from the book of the law of God. And they kept the feast seven days, and on the eighth day there was a sacred assembly according to the prescribed manner. Now, Wake up to this thought just a minute. I want to read a bit further now. And that simply establishes this principle which I'm saying. By the way, let me say that a solemn assembly, which we're going to read about here in just a minute, I don't think should be conducted until there's that sense that the people are hearing the Word of God again. I don't think it's just something you do. I've been in some churches where I believe the people thought it was just something to do. But I don't believe it's just something to do. It is true that the Jewish people had this day prescribed by law, which they discovered as they read the law of God, which was tacked on to the end of the Feast of Booths, a special day of convocation and seeking and humiliation before the Lord. But in this text of Scripture, interestingly, not a word is said about that particular day on the 22nd day of the month. However, two days later, the people assembled together for a very important solemn assembly beyond the prescription of the law all right now look at this now on the 24th day of the month that's two days after this completion of the feast of booths the children of israel were assembled with fasting and sackcloth and with dust on their heads then those of the israelite lineage separated themselves from all foreigners and i'll stop there let me make this observation not only in our return to God should there be a recovery of the preaching of the Word of God, but let me say emphatically that if we're going to return to God from the state that we've been in, there must be a deliberate humbling of ourselves before God. Now these people came with the intention, it was an intentional thing. The leaders of God, the leaders of the people had instructed them to come with sackcloth and they came on a, on a day that has been designed it wasn't part of a normal feast day and they came with an intent in their mind and the intent in their mind was to hum be humbled and to be in a state of humiliation before a holy God and there was fasting and these things are all characteristics this, humili this humility and these sort of expressions and symbols of humility were characteristic of our Old Testament days, but they speak to us of the kind of way we need to come to a day 
that we call a solemn assembly. I want you to go, keep your place in Nehemiah, and I'd like for you to go to the book of Joel quickly. The book of Joel, and let's see what we find in the second chapter of Joel. And let's read just three or four verses here from verse 15 and forward. Because I want you to see how deliberately, how, how uh, intentionally we should come to a day like this with such seriousness of preparation and thought. Now here's what we find Joel saying in verse 15. Blow the trumpet in Zion, he says. This is chapter 2, verse 15. Blow the trumpet in Zion, consecrate a fast, call a sacred assembly, gather the people, sanctify the congregation, assemble the elders, Gather the children and the nursing babes. Let the bridegroom go out from his chamber and the bride from her dressing room. Let the priest who minister to the Lord weep between the porch and the altar. Let them say, Spare your people, O God, and do not give your heritage to reproach. That the nation should rule over them. Why should they say among the people, Where is their God? Now, here is such a deliberateness about this day, such a carefulness about this day. And when you, friend, you, you pastors who lead churches come to the place where you feel, maybe some of you have great experience in this, but when you come to the place where you feel like a day of fasting and humiliation is proper before God, and God is moving in the hearts of people to hear the Word of God as He was in the hearts of these people here, there's a receptiveness to God. And that, day, that time comes up in your mind, that sense of God's leadership comes into your mind. I want you to make sure that it is it is so intentional on the part of the church that every single person has to be a part of it. If you throw this thing like you throw a Wednesday night prayer meeting, if you have this thing like you have a work day in your church where you make a few announcements and say a few things about this, you've missed the entire idea of a solemn assembly. A solemn assembly is for everybody in the church. It is for the whole church to come corporately before a holy God in humiliation before Him, humbling themselves. Do you see that? And even that you remember that the bride and the uh, bridegroom uh, had a year of, uh, uh, to develop their relationship. They didn't have to work. Don't you remember in the Old Testament? For a year, that's a pretty good plan, isn't it? But even those people, even, even the bride and the bridegroom in their honeymoon period were told to come out for this special day. The nursing children were to be there. Everybody was to be there on this special day. Now let's go back to our passage in Nehemiah. There is a wonderful statement that I'll read for you out of the book of Isaiah, and I want you to hear it carefully. In Isaiah 57, the Lord says this, For thus says the high and the lofty one, who inhabits eternity. Isn't that a fascinating phrase? He inhabits all of time, from all of the past to all of the future. He inhabits eternity, whose name is holy. This is what he says. I dwell in the high and the lofty and the holy place. And with him who has a contrite and humble spirit. To revive the spirit of the humble. And to revive the heart of the contrite. I don't understand how God could dwell in any of us. But he said, I have a dwelling place. And the dwelling place is in the contrite man, woman, congregation. Isn't that something? Do you think God knows where he will invest himself and what? Do you think God knows what's important to him? And do you think God has given enough expression of that to let us know? My friends, listen to me. Most of our churches are so full of this obnoxious pride. As Baxter called it, the dung of our pride. And we're so filled with our pride and we're bragging about ourselves, we're boasting about all that we do. And yet God has said, that's not why I dwell. That's not where I dwell. Now listen to me, friends. If that's what God says, if he does not dwell in those places, then no matter what people think is happening in those places, it's not God. God dwells in the lowly and the contrite. That's his dwelling place. If we long for a visitation of God, doesn't it make sense? to you and to me that we should be humble before our God. 
We should come with contriteness. I don't know, I discipline my children pretty strongly. I know you do as well. I hope you do. You should. And as I discipline them, you know, uh, if I get through the discipline and they're not contrite, uh, it's not over yet, is it? And we learned the whole idea of disciplining from God. And this spiritual drunkenness that we have in our land, this leanness of soul, even though we have fullness of activity, this judgment of God will continue, won't it? Until we are contrite in heart. That's the reason I've said to you, don't take the mechanics of a solemn assembly and try to do it until your people are ready to come humbly before a God that is holy. He won't have anything to do with it. It will add to our abomination. Our prayers will be more abominable to God for our hypocrisy. But God, you know, just like when my child, if your child came into you after some period of doing something wrong and he came into your bedroom and he said, Daddy, I'm so broken. I'm so sad about what I've done. What would you do? Would you be inclined toward the heart of your child? I'll guarantee you, you would. And God is a loving Father like that. In fact, the Bible says in that First Peter passage that John spoke of, our James passage, that God has a yearning in his heart for his own. But he can't come to us in his manifest power and his greatness and goodness in that conscious way unless we're willing to be contrite and broken in spirit. He will not despise us if we are like that. Charles Simeon, who lived in the latter part of the uh, mid to latter part of the 1700s and then into the 1800s, was uh, a man uh, very uh, conversant with what it meant to be humble before God. He was a single man who spent large portions of his day in, uh, you know, in communion with God. And once I read a statement by him, it's almost too hard to take. And I want to read it for you, and I want you to hear what he's saying. And you may not agree with it, and uh, so many people wouldn't agree with this in our therapeutic day, but I want you to hear what he says. Simeon said, I have never thought that the circumstance of, having, of God's having forgiven me was any reason why I should forgive myself. On the contrary, I have always judged it better to loathe myself the more in proportion as I was assured that God was pacified toward me. Now think, listen to it carefully before you rule it out. He gives the reference of Ezekiel 16, 63. And then he says this, Nor have I been satisfied with viewing my sins as men view the stars in a cloudy night, one here and another there and with great intervals in between but have endeavored to get and to, and to preserve continually before my eyes such a view of them as we have of the stars in, in the brightest night, the greater and the smaller all intermingled and all forming, as it were, one continual mass, nor yet as committed a long time ago and at many successive years, but as all forming an aggregate, an aggregate of guilt and needing the same measure of humiliation daily as they needed at the very moment they were committed. Nor would I willingly rest with such a view as presents itself to the naked eye. I have desired and do daily desire that God would put, so to speak, a telescope to my eye and enable me to see not a thousand only, but millions of my sins, which are more numerous than all the stars which God himself beholds and more than the sands upon the seashore. There are but two objects that I have ever desired for these 40 years, Simeon says, to behold. One is my own vileness. Sounds like the hymn of Isaac Watts, doesn't it? One of my own vileness, he said. And the other is the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. I have always thought that they should be viewed together. Just as Aaron confessed all the sins of all Israel whilst he put them on the head of the scapegoat. Now, in our psychological and therapeutic day, that's almost too hard for us to understand, isn't it? However, this was the secret to many men's view of God. They had a deep sense of humiliation before God, a humbling before God. Now, let me give you a third thing as we go back to our text. I want you to notice this as we're coming down. Look at this. In chapter 9, again, you'll notice that 
as they came in this deliberate fashion, serious before God, it says in the end of chapter 2, they stood and they confessed their sins and the iniquities of their fathers. And they stood up in the place and read from the book of the law of the Lord their God for one-fourth of the day. And for one-fourth, another fourth, they confessed and they worshiped to their God. And then he gives a list of men there. They stood on the stairs of the Levites and they cried out with a loud voice, to the Lord your God. And it says that those men in verse 5 said, and the following, you will notice, is a long confession of sin. I'm not going to read all of this, but it is a long confession of sin. Now, it's interesting what has happened here in this passage of Scripture. It is true that if we're going to return to God, there must also be an honest relating of our sins to God, not just a humbling ourselves before God, but there must be an honest relating of our sins to to God. Thomas Manton said in a rather colorful language, I, it's unforgettable, he said, confession is the vomit of the soul. What, what a description. And you know, there comes a point, I'm, I hope I'm not too graphic here, but I don't want to be, but there comes a point, it's true, isn't it, where one would just get to the point where they might all, often induce that just for, because of the toxic nature of, the, uh, of what is in the stomach. Do you understand? And so when a person comes and when the congregation comes to this place, it is a very natural and correct thing for us to vomit out, to expel from us those sins which we have committed. Now notice in the text of Scripture here that the confession was mixed with the reading of the law. Look at it in, in, in the text again in verse 3. They read from the book of the law of the Lord their God for one-fourth of the day, and for another fourth they confessed and worshipped the Lord their God. So you see two things in the admixture of confession. Now this is very important as we think of solemn assembly, but here they are. First of all is the reading of the law, and secondly the worship of God. The reading of the law is essential in a, a time of humiliation and confession before God so that you will not be over-scrupulous in your confession of sin. You need to know exactly what it is you have done wrong. It is also true that you do not need to be under-scrupulous. And the reading of the law of God, the understanding of what God has holds up as the standard, you know, the Bible tells us in 1 John that sin is what? It is lawlessness. And to understand our sinfulness, we must understand the law. This is what Paul was saying when he talked in Romans chapter 7. I didn't understand all this, he says. But when I saw this covetousness issue, you know, that was the one that is most internalized, I mean, on the face of it in the Ten Commandments, isn't it? And when I saw covetousness, sin revived and I died. I thought myself alive before, but when I saw that, and so it is this reading of the law of God, this understanding of the standard of God that is very helpful in people's confession. They need to make sure that they are, that they are confessing what is actual sin, disobedience to God, not underdoing it, not overdoing it. There are those overscrupulous people who will go too far. But secondly, he adds that mixture of the worship of God. And I think this is such a beautiful and helpful thought to think that he... he, he you know, and this is a very natural thing as well when you think about it, because the deeper you go into the valley of humiliation, the higher the mountain peaks of adoration are. Charles Simeon said something else which I think is absolutely beautiful. He talked about a ship, and he said, you know, I, I, never, I never feel that I ought to put up the full sails of adoration on the mast, pulling up full sail of adoration toward God without the ballast of humiliation. It's that ballast of humiliation that keeps those ships from turning over. Do you understand? And we see both of these things together. And it is so important in a time of solemn assembly. And it's so natural, isn't it? The, the, the more vile we see ourselves to be, the higher and more lofty God is. The more wonderful and precious is His grace. The more we adore Him, the more majestic He is. Don't you see that? So we mix these things together in the calling of people to confess their sins. Let me make these other observations with you that I think are important. He says here in the text that they did this, they confessed and worshipped God, the Lord their God, for a fourth of the day. Notice that it does not say that they confessed for four days. It doesn't say that. 
In fact, you will not find that, as far as I can find, any place in the Scripture, that kind of extensive day after day after day, what I call an open mic type of confession. You don't find that. It was for a fourth of the day, mixed with worship of God, that they confessed their sins before the Lord. Principally, we find in this text of Scripture, if we had time to read the uh, long confession which is given, we find, if you'll notice, that this confession was basically prayed through, prayed out loud through the lips, or the confession of the people was prayed through the lips of some representative leaders. Do you see that? They stood before the people and they prayed before God. And the picture here really is something like this. And this is what you see, I think, throughout the Bible and you see throughout the history of revival up until our our most more recent days since the Asbury revival and so forth. You don't see that kind of open mic type confession, people lining up behind a microphone, but what you find is people praying about the corporate sins, praying about the sins of the people, and then the people in deep contrition, uh, brokenhearted, down on their faces before God, feeling deeply and praying intensely about, in, in a private sense, concerning their complicity in the sin. You understand the difference between that and what we are seeing or we think, think is a model in our day for revival? I want you to understand then that there, there was no such thing then as open mic confession. This is a rather modern thing. I think it has many inherent dangers. Um, one of the things that has happened more recently that did not, in fact, happen so much in the, even in the Asbury time in the 1970s is that so much sexual content and private sins was confessed publicly in this last uh, thing that happened. And you know, that has sort of come and gone, hasn't it? And that's not the thing we're longing for that's going to transform our society. I'm appreciative of, of the fact that I believe in some of those places apparently God did visit the people. But you know, everything that God does is, it, it, I mean, when God, this is something you find in the history of revival, that when God moves, it comes through, it begins to come through the hands of, un, of, of just people, sincere people. But often, we, we, you know, there's some shaping of the things that begin to happen. And whatever is baptized in the first place begins to be the pattern, and everybody begins to think, this is the picture of revival. I dare say that most of your people, and perhaps many of you, have a view of revival. Your whole thought about God bringing revival in this country is people lining up behind a microphone. But that's not what it's about at all. More than anything, as I've said before, it's a recovery of the Word of God, and particularly a recovery of the great doctrines and powerful preaching and preaching with unction. That's what revival has always been. Think of Whitfield and what was going on in those days. It, that's what revival is. When is it right to publicly confess sin? Let me just give you this quickly. I think, first of all, when you're confessing the corporate sins of the body of Christ, as they did in this passage of Scripture. That's a, that's a correct use of public confession. Secondly, I believe when you have wronged the group, there is a place for someone to stand before the group and say, I've wronged you terribly. I must ask you to forgive me. I want to confess my sin before you. Thirdly, there is the possibility of confessing publicly, and I want to say this with a, an asterisk beside it, in a limited fashion, when there is the need for accountability. Now let me explain what I'm saying. There are people who have such immense bondage to sin that they feel that though they have tried many times to deal with that sin, if they could be accountable to other people, it would break the back of that sin. And so they think a public expression. Now that has probably more to do with our, our therapeutic day than we could possibly imagine. It's kind of a therapy technique. You understand that happens in the secular realm just as well. People can lay it all out, tell it all to a group, then they're going to feel a lot better. However, there is something to be said for that fact, but here's what I would do. If someone came to me and said that they wish to publicly confess a private sin, it really was not having to do with the body of Christ, I would say, let me take you over here to Mr. So-and-so, who lives a life of victory in that area, and you, and perhaps another man, you tell them that sin and let them work with you and they'll be, you'll be accountable to them. You understand? Or take them over to these godly ladies over here who have victory in these areas. Or some older ladies, like these two fine ladies down here, and say, here is a lady. Here, here are two ladies right here who can walk with you through this thing. You don't need to publicly confess this sin. 
there are many deep regrets already from the from the movement that has happened in these in this last couple of years of people confessing the most awful private sin there is never as far as i can tell any uh, uh, any injunction from Scripture to confess private sins in a public forum. And what an awful thing to stand before people in a mixed crowd of college students, for instance, and confess private things to people you don't even know. It's not even in a church. You, you understand what I'm saying? Where there's some sense of uh, family about it. And then I think there might be a chance, a time, that you would have public confession when testifying after a vict victory in that sin with the permission of those people involved. So there might be that time where one would confess with discreetness, uh, maybe in more generalities, but confess some private sin in a public way. We have found that it is important to gather a catalog of sins, if I could just be practical with you for a moment, that when you come to a day of solemn assembly, that it is a, it is a good idea to, con to get the people in the method that I've been using has been helpful is to use small groups, even if you have to divide your own congregation up into groups to meet in your home, uh, so that everybody in the church has an opportunity to hear from your own mouth what a solemn assembly is all about. And, and then try to get them, perhaps through three by five cards, they can write down a particular sin prayerfully that they feel like is prevalent in the congregation. Uh, it may not be what they are committing. It might be what they are committing, but it's something that they observe seems to dominate in the congregation. Maybe it's carelessness of fathers. Maybe it's gossip. Maybe it's too much love for entertainment, not a seriousness about life. It could be a number of things. And they should use one card for each of the sins that they uh, wish to uh, bring to consideration. Then you take those, perhaps with another group of pastors or leaders, and you prayerfully add to and Work with the things that have been said. You're under no obligation to put everything that you've received down on a piece of paper. But you try to just, before God, understand what are the main sins that the people are recognizing and that I can add to and recognize that they may be unaware of. What are these main sins that we see prevalent in our congregation? Maybe it'll be eight or ten sins. And I want to suggest to you that you put those down not with a word like pride, but that you put them down in a paragraph so that you can explain yourself, okay, how this is working out in the congregation. And then you can actually copy that uh, so everybody who comes to the day of solemn assembly will have a time. They'll have that before them. You'll have a time where those will be read by the leaders of the congregation. Maybe you will read them. And then a time where the body is engaged in a long, a lengthy, and serious period of prayer going through those sins that are the sins of the church. Do you understand? You're welcome to call me and talk with me about how those things have worked. I remember once being in a town in California where we did something like this. And uh, my, what a, what a thing it was. Just to feel God bringing these things before the people all in one package. And, and what a humbling it brought to the congregation. And, you know, we did that, and we worked through those public sins, the, I mean, those corporate sins, and then we sent them off to work with their private sins alone, and then they came back together, and I did allow for a time of public confession, and I had the pastor just sitting down here in the front, and everybody that came and said anything talked to that pastor first. I think that's why. I don't think there's anything that, that hinders any of the movement of God to do that. And they came and talked to that pastor, and he sent some of them back, and some of them he sent to the front. And there was a powerful display. I remember one man, it cost him $40,000 to get right with God. Another man, it cost him his job. Two men, in fact, it cost him their jobs to get right with God. One man was a minister. It cost him his job. There must be a proper confessing or relating of our sins to God. Can I bring you to the final place now? And I hope I'm not dragging on too long. But let me just come to this final place. I want us to see that in the fourth place, there must be a resolve to sin no longer. There must be a resolve to sin no longer. If you'll notice, in verse 38 of chapter 9, they have now come through their confession of sin. And in verse 38, you have these words. And because of this, and they're telling this to God, because of this, we make a sure covenant and we write it. Our leaders 
our Levites, and our priests seal it. Then if you'll go on over in verse 28 and 29, now the rest of the people, and there are the names of the people who signed it. Do you see it? And recorded for all eternity. And now verse 28, now the rest of the people, the priests, the Levites, the gatekeepers, the singers, the Nephinim, and those who had separated themselves from the people of the lands to the law of God, their wives, their sons, their daughters, and everyone who had knowledge and understanding, these joined with their brethren, their nobles, and entered into a curse and an oath to walk in God's law, which was given by Moses, the servant of God, and to observe and do all the commandments of the Lord our God and his ordinances and his statutes. And then they go on to spe specify, I think, in three, three uh, very distinct, issues which were current problems for them. You see? Now one way then to deal with this issue of sin and the life of the church is having come through a time of humbling and fasting before God and admitting our sins is to come to a place of covenant before God. I suggest that you take that list of sins that you've been given and if there has been deep contrition, if there has been a movement of God and a seriousness among the people. I, can, I, I think it is a wise thing to then turn the wording of that catalog of sins into a covenant before the Lord. Turn it around and reverse it around and say, Lord, we will do this and that and the other. And then for the weeks beyond and, and for the foreseeable future, you hold this out before the people and you hear about it and you talk about it. And the leaders of the people, I often stand the leaders of the people up before the people and say, now listen, here is the covenant. Here is what people are saying. Will you, will you work seriously in the lives of these people to see these things happen? Somebody said at one time that remorse is being sorry and repentance is being sorry enough to stop. And this was their way of saying to God, we just don't, it's not just that we want to come and feel cathartic about releasing all of our sins before you, you know, we don't want just sort of this feeling of, of sort of cleansing here, but we want to do more than that. What you're after is not just hearing about our sin. What you're after is our obedience. And we want to stop these things, and we want to begin to do the right things. And this is a, this is a, this is a place where we're turning in our church. And with great seriousness, then you begin, you continue to bring these things to the mind of the people for the foreseeable future. They may contain specific elements that are not forever, but they are for the foreseeable future because they're the weaknesses of the church and the sins of the church then. Do you understand? All right. Let me finish with what I could long to see happen among us as ministers. I want to I go back 300, 400 years of back to Edinburgh, Scotland, actually to Edinburgh and a few other places. And I want to just tell you about what happened 401 years ago. In fact, it happened just a few days from now, on March the 24th, in fact. The Reformation had, uh, in Scotland, had now passed about, the, the heat of the Reformation had now kind of come through about 30 years prior to this. And so only some of the older men knew the flame of the Reformation. Now, there was a man, he was kind of an irascible fellow. His name was John Davidson. Not everybody liked him because he was always bugging them about holiness. And John Davidson oppressed upon Scotland. For several years, had tried to press the condition of the churches onto the ministers and make them reckon with what was happening now in, in the in this sort of downgrade from the Reformation. Once in the Synod of Fife, which was his synod uh, as a Presbyterian, three years earlier, he had pleaded with the ministers, and he said this, that the ordinary and lawful armor of fasting and prayer alone could protect the land from the consequences of the negligence and profaneness of its pastors. The next year, in 1594, he attacked those ministers who were orthodox in their beliefs, but he said, yet the truth was so unfaithfully delivered and so coldly that their flocks were consumed with hunger. Finally, he brought the issue to his own presbytery in Haddington. 
And they prevailed upon him, having caught the spirit of what he was saying finally, they prevailed upon him to bring these concerns before the General Assembly, which would meet in Edinburgh, Scotland. Now, he wrote this up, this appeal. It was a list, it was a long list of sins, sins that the magistrates were committing, sins that the people would commit. And you know the state church idea is a whole different feel uh, than what we think about as in our Baptistic view. But at any rate, he, he brought all of this down on pieces of paper, and his largest section was about the awfulness, the profaneness of the ministers. The assembly was convened then, March 24th, in 1596. They met in the east part of the Giles, St. Giles Cathedral in Edinburgh. This is the place that Robert Bruce had made quite famous. Now, the East Wing, you remember the Catholic churches had been now reformed, and they were Protestant churches, and the East Wing was simply that part of the cross, if you know, in a Catholic church, that, that part. It was sort of partitioned off, and it, was, it, was, it had a dirt floor, and they put rushes down on the floor. It was a very uncomfortable place to have a warm and intimate meeting. Amen. But there they were in the little church, they called it. And immediately when, when they began their meeting in, in Edinburgh, they, they had a disagreement. They, uh, there were some differences of opinion about what ought to be the order of business. And many of them felt like the, very, the pressing conflict of the Spanish uh, with Scotland was the utmost concern that needed to be brought before the group. But finally, wisdom prevailed, and they determined that it was the need to face their sins which would be the most important thing. And so they voted unanimously to have Davidson present the catalog of sins. He did this on the next day, which was on Wednesday. The assembly approved the document with a provision that some additions be made by a committee. So they had those back then. And the committee added to the document some censures for things that were done, for sins, if they were not corrected. Now, included among these things... Uh, uh, in, the, in the category of sins for ministers were things like this. They talked about pastors who shall be found not given to their books. It's encouraging, isn't it? Not given to their books and study of scriptures. Not careful to have books. I'm liking this better all the time. Listen to this. Not given to sanctification. Are you given to sanctification? Are, are you really making progress? And prayer not given to prayer, that study not be powerful and spiritual, hmm. N not applying the doctrine to his corruptions. My. Which is the pastor's gift. Being obscure and too scholastic before the people, cold and lacking zeal, Negligence in visiting the sick, caring for the poor, or indiscreet in choosing parts of the word, not, as he said, not meetest for the flock. Being flatterers, especially of great personages in their congregation out of fear. And so on. Well, this indictment came before the assembly again on Friday the 26th. They determined, quote, there should be a humiliation among the ministry before their departure. And they determined they were going to do that on Tuesday of the next week. They tried to decide who should preach. A couple of men were suggested. Finally, they settled on John Davidson. John Davidson complained a little bit. He said, I, after all, he said, I have to go all the way back home and preach to my people. You know, it's a, it's a considerable thing to preach one or two hours as they did. And he said, I've got to preach to my people. I don't know if I'll have time to prepare well. But they insisted, and he determined that it was God's will. And when they came back together on Tuesday at 9 o'clock in the morning, there were about 400 present, virtually all ministers and a few godly leaders who were along with them. Davidson preached an extended sermon, probably about two hours long, on the 13th and 34th chapters of Ezekiel about shepherds who feed themselves. You remember that awful passage. One historian who was there said, he was very moving in application to the present time so that within an hour after they entered the kirk, they looked with one another, with, with another countenance than that wherewith they entered. He sent them to silent meditation and confession. The emotion overcame the men for the next quarter of an hour. 
And here's what they said. There were such sighs and sobs with shedding of tears among the most of all the estates that were present, most part of all estates that were present, everyone provoking another by their example, and the teacher himself by his example, that the kirk resounded so that the place might worthily have been called a boken, for the like of that day was never seen in Scotland since the Reformation. As every man confessed, there have been many days of humiliation for present or imminent dangers, he said. But the like for sin and defection was there never seen. They met later that afternoon and determined, or heard him preach again on Luke chapter 12, and many were then comforted by that passage. And they determined that they would meet in their separate synods, the various pastors from separate areas, that afternoon, and they discussed how they might bring this to the people. But before they left that day, after they had heard the preaching of Davidson on Luke 12, they were now leaving with a sense of having done business with God. Davidson called upon them to hold their hands up if they would take enter into a new league with God. Now, what he meant was, I want you to hold your hand up if you're willing to covenant with God to obey him. Now, we don't know whether he, it's, it's hard to determine whether he, had, he re, was referring to a covenant that was already written, which they were known for, or a new covenant that was written or unwritten, but he had them all indicate, and everyone did except one man who later terribly apostatized. And they all raised their hand joyfully submitting to the Lord. That same pattern was carried to synod after synod across Scotland until there was a mighty recovery, a returning to God. I'm of the conviction, I've thought about this quite a while, <laughs> it's prob probably the best place to see God work in solemn assembly in the initial stages is among the ministers of the land. And that if we would be broken and contrite before God and return to God on his terms, then God might do a mighty thing, the likes of which we have not seen since the Great Awakening in the United States. I want us to bow our heads and pray. Let's close our eyes. Now, you have listened a long time, and I'm so deeply appreciative that you would. But let's go to the Lord now and pray. Father, thank you for these glorious moments to look in your word. Thank you for the beauty of Scripture and the clarity of the word. We pray, Lord, that we might be men who return to the word, who can lead people into great humiliation before you, who can help people through that time of confession of sin in the proper way, and who will resolve to sin no longer. We pray that you might do that among us. There might be something seen among us unlike anything we have known in our own lifetime. Thank you, Father. We look to you in Jesus' name.